Thanks for joining us for today's webinar from Grounds for our Partnership. My name is Simon Stockton and today we're going to be talking about an approach to support planning that we call Empower and Enable, which is designed to put people at the heart of the process and to make it as simple as possible for people to develop their own uh, support plan. Before we kick off with the webinar, I'm going to ask Kerry from Helen Sanders and Associates to help us make sure that everyone is able to contribute uh, and uh, knows what to do if they want to ask a question. We'll be taking questions at the end of the presentation. Um, so Kerry is just going to walk you through how to do that in case uh, anyone's not entirely sure. Kerry. Thank you, Simon. Through. Hello everybody. Uh, just a quick run through if I may, just to make sure that everybody can hear myself and Simon okay. Uh, next to your name there will be an icon of a hand. It will be a grey hand or a yellow hand. Please could you click onto that hand just to show that you can hear me. Okay, I can see that two people can hear me, so I'm just waiting for a couple more people. So it should be very close to where your name is. It'll be a hand and it'll be a grey or yellow hand. Okay, that's great. Thank you very much. You can now click back off the hand to remove it from the screen. Lovely. Thank you. Okay, so at any stage during today's webinar, you can type any questions or comments that you have into the questions box that's on the control panel on your screen. So you just type your question or comment into the box and then press the send button. That will send your questions through to myself and I will then read them out at the end of the webinar. Thank you, Simon. Thanks very much for that, Kerry. Um, mindful for the webinar today, we've got a couple of people, I think, from outside the UK joining us, which is fantastic and welcome to you guys. Uh, and we've also had a number of people uh, mostly from Australia who requested a recording of the webinar. The webinar will be available um, as a download after today's session. So any of your colleagues or friends who might be interested in, um, in hearing what we're sharing today, you can refer to um, the recorded version of this presentation. So as I said, we're going to be talking about a particular approach to, uh, to support planning. Um, that is something that we've been developing over the last few years uh, and dovetails very neatly with um, the current government's approach to uh, the transformation of social care within the UK. So uh, it is very much about building on people's gifts, skills and talents and having an asset-based approach to support planning where we assume that people will be able to uh, not only take part in the process, but also to lead the process of developing their own plan. Um, it's very much about uh, making it possible for people to develop plans that are scalable uh, and flexible so that, so that um, the amount of effort that people put in feels the right size, the right amount of effort for what people want to get out of it. For some people that might be a lot, for other people it might be a small amount because it's very clear what they want to do already. And it very much fits with the idea of people having direct control over the process, over the process of uh, both how their support operates and the process of thinking about uh, what they might want to do with the resources, both formal and informal, that are available to them. So a slight apologies for uh, our international colleagues of this uh, kind of UK-centric kind of flavour to kick us off with. but. Uh, we'll be pushing past that very shortly. Uh, this is just um, a snapshot from the Care and Support White Paper that emphasizes the person-centered nature of the transformation um, that we're aiming for in the UK and the integral um, role that people developing their own care and support plan has in, in that transformation, which you can see from this, uh, from this diagram is something that the uh, the government is 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 clearly emphasising. The particular model that we're going to be describing and talking about today um, is drawn from a piece of work that we did for uh, um, an organisation called Think, Pers uh, Think Local Act Personal, which um, some of you may know is a sector-led partnership. 
uh, encompassing, I think, currently about 50 organizations, between 30 and 50 organizations, um, largely provider organizations and some statutory organizations and many umbrella organizations um, of, of uh, providers and not-for-profits and advice type, uh, type agencies that are all committed to um, transforming social care within the UK to uh, develop a more personalized uh, approaches to, um, uh, to the delivery of, of, uh, of social care support in all its different guises. And the particular piece of work that, um, uh, uh, from which this model Empower and Enable emerged uh, was uh, designed to explore some of the sticky issues that many councils were experiencing in making good support planning available to large numbers of people. So um, when councils started to grapple with um, throughout 2011 and into 2012, the idea of scaling up uh, personal projects to be something that would be available for the vast majority of people eligible for social care, allied with that challenge was a, was a uh, significant difficulty in trying to make sure that people could have uh, the right time, the right support, the right level of effort um, to make really good plans for themselves. Uh, and that was uh, something that people were generally finding was possible with small numbers of people, uh, but could be quite time intensive uh, and difficult with large numbers of people. So uh, TLAP commissioned a piece of work to, to think about with three authorities initially. Um, what were the key issues that people were really struggling with that were making it difficult to scale up um, good support planning activity and what we might be able to do to uh, to kind of turn that on its head and make that happen for more people. So the core issues that there was consensus around that seemed to kind of be the, the really stickiest ones uh, were, were these. Um, many people were telling us that support planning uh, was over professionalized that was too time intensive um, for um, frontline uh, practitioners from uh, social care authorities and consequently that it was particularly costly in many cases and this was brought out by last year's uh, community care magazines annual personalization survey uh, very few people were either leading the process themselves or getting support from uh, from user-led organizations. In fact, no one in the community care survey last year who was asked was getting support from the ULO. Uh, and very few people getting support from, uh, from families and, uh, uh, and friends to help them develop their plans. We know that that's changed uh, to some degree. The new uh, a POET survey, which has recently been published in the last couple of weeks on Think Local Act Personal's uh, website, which surveys, I think, 3,000 people, um, uh, 1,500 people using personal projects and 1,500 people uh, uh, who are carers of people with personal projects, shows that there are um, some changes where people are uh, getting um, more support from friends and family, but still uh, we think generally the picture, particularly for people leading the process themselves, is, is relatively poor. For those authorities that we spoke to in um, uh, in relation to this work, many of them were saying that support planning was accessed through um, the, the, the assessment process and therefore support planning tools and the reach of, of support planning uh, uh, tools, if you like, wasn't extending to people who weren't eligible for social care. Uh, for us in the UK, that, that's governed by what we call a fair access to care uh, eligibility threshold. So if you didn't meet that threshold, uh, then you wouldn't necessarily be being signposted or have support to help you make a plan uh, for your uh, future care and support needs. Um, many people told us that the sign-off processes for plans once they had been developed were particularly opaque and complex. Um, sign-off uh, could take some time, so delays were occurring uh, when, um, when people's plans were um, being logged with the local authority um, for sign-off, so before the money could be 
or the budget could be implemented, uh, there was a specific delay happening at that stage. And there were also a number of complaints about the uh, disproportionate way in which support plan information was being collected. So uh, detailed support plans be, uh, um, were uh, generally considered to be necessary even when the risks uh, were particularly low or what people were intending to do was relatively straightforward. There was a, a, a one, um, a, a single approach to considering what, what information would be required from people and that was for many um, too burdensome uh, and too, um, too involved. So out of that um, conversation and deep dive, if you, if you like, into the, the kind of the, the thorny issues of what wasn't working um, in relation to support planning, we asked people what it would look like if we could turn that on its head and put people at the center of the process and to find a way of working that would continue to empower people to, um, to do more for themselves in relation to planning. Um, and require less dependency upon um, paid professional support where that wasn't necessarily appropriate. And the model that we developed um, from those conversations is described in this graphic uh, that you can see on your screen that we, we coined the term empower and enable um, to describe it. It starts from the premise that we, we assume as our starting point uh, that people with the right uh, approach um, uh, have the skills and the uh, assets to be able to make their own plan. Um, and the, our job um, as uh, support planning um, uh, professionals, if you like, is to uh, provide a range of approaches to help people uh, take uh, the maximum level of of control and have the maximum level of involvement in that process to make it um, centered around them and to make it a meaningful exercise. So we asked people initially um, uh, how you want to make your support plan uh, and we make available a range of resources depending upon uh, people's individual learning styles. Um, so some people might like to have a step-by-step guide to working through um, like, a, like a simple recipe, how to develop uh, a support plan. Some people might prefer to have um, access to videos of people describing how they've made their own uh, support plan. Uh, some people might uh, benefit from having online resources uh, if they have uh, internet access and are familiar with web-based tools. And the initial approach is about making sure that we, we listen to what people's preferred learning styles are and we take an approach or we signpost people to the self-help tools, if you like, uh, the resources that can help people in a way that makes most sense to them, whilst also leaving them with contact details of people who have lived experience of developing their own plans and who can offer um, encouragement uh, initially and potentially support to help them make use of the tools um, that are the simple tools that are going to um, help them develop their own plan. So that's stage one. Uh, we give people then time to, uh, to, to make use of those tools and, and to, to grapple with them and start to work on their support plan and only after an agreed interval uh, we then check in to see uh, how they're getting on and evaluate what other support would be useful to help them uh, through the process of finishing their plan and making sure that it's, um, it, it does what they want it to do and also meets um, all of the criteria that are going to be necessary to get it signed off uh, from the commissioning authority, which in most cases would be um, uh, a uh, CCG or a local authority. Um, again, we give people some time to uh, to work with that additional extra support if they if they are needing it and using it. And if that uh, uh, at the end of uh, again an, another agreed period, if people at that point need more help, 
then we uh, we can signpost them to face-to-face -face support. Uh, that might be from a provider or from a social work professional or from a peer support worker uh, who can help them to finish off the process. Now this, pro this, this approach may not work for everyone and it may be necessary to jump certain steps. It may be appropriate for some people to just go straight to um, having one-to-one -one, uh, professional advice to help build a support plan. But the key thing about this that's different from how support planning has tended to work uh, in the UK within social care uh, and also emerging uh, in, in, with people using healthcare uh, budgets as well, is that uh, it doesn't assume that everyone will automatically need um, intensive professional one-to-one -one, uh, support to create their plan. The emphasis is on uh, assuming that people can and will do it for themselves and building support around people incrementally that focuses on um, self-help tools and peer support and only using uh, professional resources where that's uh, really required rather than as a default. This kind of approach can only work, um, uh, it's not too much of a stress to, to stretch to, to kind of uh, to imply this, uh, where the commissioning authority is also um, lining up its ducks, if you like, to, to make that approach possible. So it, in order for, for people to have confidence to take control of their planning, it's really going to be critical that they know exactly what the, uh, the sign-off criteria are going to be at the beginning um, of that process. So before you start to do a lot of work on your support plan, you really need to know that what you're doing is going to be um, useful uh, and is going to meet the criteria that the local authority or the, um, uh, the health commissioning authority is going to need um, to say, yes, that's fine, and to release the resources um, that, uh, uh, that are going to comprise your budget. It's also important that staff who are working on the assessments for, uh, for people who uh, meet the eligibility criteria and go on to be offered budgets uh, can also work in this asset-based uh, way so that, so that it's not um, an unfamiliar uh, or counter-cultural um, uh, way of working with people. Um, we really need staff, frontline staff, to be taking uh, a leap to make that assumption that people um, can uh, and will uh, be able to, to, in many cases, um, develop their own support plan, and that's, the, and that's the right way to work with them. It's also important to make sure that people have permission to be able to use their budget in uh, flexible and innovative ways. If that's not possible, uh, then the, the, the rationale and the motivation for people to, uh, to develop plans is going to be severely limited. Uh, and that can be an issue, uh, particularly in, uh, in areas that are struggling with, with, uh, with financial pressures, to make sure that people still have uh, um, permission to use budgets in ways that may not look like the traditional things that people tend to buy uh, with, um, uh, with, with uh, commission services. And we know that, that uh, um, from doing that, uh, that people tend to be able to get much better outcomes if they are able to, to use budgets flexibly in ways that make the most sense to them. Um, there's also an issue about how much of a plan is shared. So uh, it may be that, that in developing a plan, some people would like to um, share some parts of that plan, but keep some parts of it uh, private. And it's important that authorities can make a distinction between the information that they need and the things that people are allowed to, uh, to keep to themselves. So only requiring high-level information about what people are intending to do with their budget is really critical to the building trust with people um, that can underpin this approach. And having a proportionate approach to monitoring uh, where um, when we're asking people how they're making use of their budgets and what, how what they're doing um, is uh, how well that's working for them. Um, how much detail we're requiring of people 
um, and the relation of that to the, the risks uh, for that particular individual is important to balance in the right way so that again we don't undermine that relationship of trust that's essential to build uh, for this approach to work. And again that comes up with reviews. So reviews need to also take a, a consistent approach um, in order for this to be effective. So that's the approach, that's the, um, uh, the model, if you like, that, that, uh, that we developed through this, this, uh, uh, this piece of work, originally commissioned, as I said, for Think Local Act Personal. Over the last couple of years, we've been um, tracking and working with people who have been picking up these, uh, these methods in one way, shape, or form, and trying to develop some uh, um, interactive learning about how um, this can translate to practice and what it takes to, uh, to implement this on the ground. Uh, and we have a publication uh, which, as all of our publications are, is open source and you can get from our, our, uh, our website, which is www.grantswellpartnership.co.uk, uh, that considers the learning from those people who have been working hard to, to, uh, to put this into practice. And I guess um, most of the lessons that we've, we've learned, most of the things that people have been telling us um, could arguably kind of come under the general theme of uh, being proactive and taking a proactive approach to culture change um, as being critical to, to, to making a success uh, of, um, uh, of this kind of step change in the way that support planning um, can work. So some areas, uh, and Lancashire County Council uh, uh, is, is one of these, have begun to think about setting uh, specific targets for the numbers of people who are leading uh, the development of their own support plans and using that as a, uh, as a tool to measure um, the progress towards this kind of way of working, as well as focusing on building people's capacity and confidence um, to make uh, to make this approach uh, workable and, and, uh, and practical on the ground. I'll say a little bit more about, about Lancashire shortly. Um, there's a lovely quote there from uh, a woman who up until recently was the Chief Executive Officer of an organisation called Breakthrough UK, uh, which is working with a number of authorities in the North West to um, develop support planning. Uh, and her um, uh, um, view from personal experience was that we often become, or people with support needs can often uh, be fitted into a system where dependency upon professionals is all too common and uh, an approach that, that, uh, that runs against that uh, is something that's, that's really timely and really empowering uh, and um, we need to think about how we can make that happen for, for large numbers of people. Um, some other lessons from different areas, again, really uh, 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 related to kind of culture change, really, and how you kind of um, the, the kind of nuances of, of uh, uh, how you might kind of frame that if you're looking at, at, um, uh, at developing this kind of approach, starting early and keeping it simple. Um, so making sure that there's a kind of common language and a, a common way of understanding what we're trying to achieve. Um, is something that a, a, a number of places have flagged up as being uh, really critical to, to uh, getting this to float. Um, making sure that people understand uh, um, what's in it for them. Um, so uh, that this support plan isn't just something that uh, has to be developed in order to access your resources um, that you've been provisionally allocated. It's not just uh, getting you through the gate to be able to, to, to get your budget, but it's also about, and more importantly, um, should be about uh, helping you to think creatively about uh, how to use all the resources that are available to you to live the life that you want to lead. Um, so changing the emphasis to make, to make it something that people can relate to, uh, really important. And also giving people the time necessary to uh, to develop plans uh, is something again that Lancashire has spent particularly some some uh, some energy in thinking about how to make work. But trying to draw 
um, uh, support planning from the constraints of uh, the sometimes rigid process with the clear timelines for uh, for getting from the beginning of assessment to being offered a personal budget uh, for some people uh, who might uh, be in a position where they have not yet got clear what their long-term support needs are, um, having an interim process where people can develop short-term plans uh, with short-term goals uh, can be a way through that. I'm just going to finish with some examples uh, in a little bit more detail of uh, places that have been um, taking these ideas forward uh, and say a little bit about uh, what we know of, of uh, the learning from, from uh, a small number of of, uh, of places. The first one is Trafford Council, it's a metropolitan authority in the north of England. And um, they've used this uh, pyramid um, diagram to explain a very similar kind of concept or the same concept in a different way, if you like, um, about what they're aiming to achieve um, that's different from how support planning has worked in the past. So in the past, the majority of people would have used specialist brokers. Um, and a smaller number of people would have used peer support, and an even smaller number still would have used um, uh, uh, um, self-help tools, open source tools to develop their own support plans. What they're aiming to do is to invert that pyramid uh, and have the majority of people, um, at least by uh, the default kind of uh, assumption, um, starting to, to create their own plans and then bring in peer support and offer drop-in services and then refer to specialist brokers for those people for whom that, those two approaches are not, uh, are not enough. Uh, Lancashire, um, going back to uh, their um, approach to um, give people more space and time, which they've coined uh, Time to Think initiative. Um, enabling people to develop uh, short-term plans um, and have uh, short-term support in place um, uh, so that they can have more time to think about their longer-term support needs and more time to develop a plan which is going to see them through uh, a longer period of, of, uh, of time. So um, those periods are, are flexed according to individual circumstances and needs. But the idea is very clearly to build um, uh, the time necessary uh, um, around support planning rather than fix it into a, a rigid schedule that forces people through a process uh, with plans that aren't going to uh, be able to, to be informed in a, uh, with people's thinking because people aren't in the right place to, uh, to do that thinking at that particular time. Um, Lancashire have made a, a significant investment in um, community-based support planning uh, um, resources. So they are moving the, uh, a significant portion of their um, support planning professional expertise from the local authority into community-based organizations built around a hub. Uh, and they're looking at, um, as well as their kind of uh, sign-offs processes and back office systems to make sure that, that those are fully aligned with the kind of approach that we're talking about. They're also looking at what it's going to take to um, develop and promote this common approach to support planning um, that people can buy into and adopt and what that means in relation to people's training needs for, for people within those community based organizations as well as their frontline staff um, to work with people differently. Another example, which is a health example here from Hampshire, um, it's a county is in the south of England, um, and uh, uh, the Hampshire Partnership NHS Foundation Trust uh, has a pilot looking at people um, uh, with uh, substance misuse issues, focusing on um, uh, um, supporting them to develop uh, uh, support plans that are going to be meaningful uh, to them and trying to find the right tools that are uh, going to help them to do that. So experimenting with, with a number of different person-centered tools to find out which ones are going to work best 
and trying to change the uh, the way in which professionals work with people to uh, empower them to to be able to use those tools for themselves to develop their own support plans. So really interesting and uh, quite groundbreaking uh, piece of work going on there. The last example um, is from an independent social work practice in Shropshire, uh, it's a county in the Midlands, um, uh, set up uh, in the last couple of years. And uh, they take people um, particularly focused on initially on people with short-term needs through the full assessment and support planning uh, uh, process. And they've developed a community-based uh, uh, um, um, office uh, kind of hub presence, um, networking with lots of other community organizations and offering uh, a number of different ways of, of, of um, people to access peer support to help them build their, ports, their own support plans. Uh, and are beginning to find some really uh, positive outcomes in the people's confidence um, for, uh, uh, for taking on that responsibility. And also so, some really um, uh, positive findings in relation to the cost effectiveness of, of that approach. So the people coming through, and these are still relatively early indications, but they um, uh, seem to be consistent and, and, uh, um, uh, and are really uh, encouraging uh, early indicators uh, that support planning is significantly more cost effective because not only are people taking on more of that um, uh, um, time themselves to develop the plans, but also they're um, through the approach that's being developed and through using the, the right um, person-centered thinking tools, um, they're using more informal support uh, from within their local networks and within their local communities um, to get the right balance for them uh, between informal and, and formal support. So really positive signs there um, that uh, adopting this approach can have uh, significant benefits for individuals and significant um, improvements in the, the potential sustainability uh, for making good support planning work for larger numbers of people. So um, I'm going to end at that point uh, and we're going to go over to Kerry to check um, if we have any questions from Thank you, Simon. Uh, we don't have any questions at the moment. Um, so what I would just like to say to the people who have attended today's webinar is if they would like to type a question in before we end the webinar, if you'd like to just place your hand up again for me and we'll wait until you've typed your question. If we don't get any hands up, we know that you've got all the information that you need and that you would let us know at a later date should you require anything further. Thank you very much. We've got no hand, Simon, so that people have all the information that they need for today. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for, for those of you joining us. I hope you enjoyed it. And um, hope, to, uh, um, hope you'll join us again for our future webinars.